Our particular psalm this week is Psalm 73. I'm going to read our text for us in its entirety. And when I finish reading the text, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, at which point I would appreciate very much if you would respond by saying, thanks be to God. Would you join me now in standing for the reading of God's word in order to show reverence and awe? One final time, our text today is Psalm 73. God's word says this. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly, you have set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment. Swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. By way of introduction, if you have your sermon notes, feel free to follow along. I've written this. The psalmist believes that God will continue to be good to Israel as a whole, but he is doubting whether or not God will be good to him personally. Don't miss this, church. In verse 1, the very beginning of our text, truly God is good to Israel. From the outset of our text, the psalmist has no difficulty, no challenge, no struggle in believing with all of his heart, trusting fully that God will be faithful and good to Israel. But then he proceeds within the next 16 verses, give or take, to talk about what, what, what if we're not careful, would look like blasphemy, the injustice of God. That's essentially what he's saying. He, he comes very close to, to the edge, to the precipice of blaspheming God, of accusing God of injustice. He speaks of, of the benefit of the righteous. He speaks about how the righteous are blessed by God all day long. They're, they're fat. They're, they're provided for. They're cared for. That, that, that the wicked, are, not the righteous rather, but the wicked are fat and provided for. That the wicked are esteemed. That the wicked have their way. 
and that they're permitted by God, who is sovereign over all things. He could stop it if he so desired, and yet the wicked are permitted to oppress the righteous, to take advantage of them, to prey upon them. This is the per- perception of the psalmist. He's lamenting what appears to him to be injustice on the part of God. That God provides for the wicked and has abandoned the righteous. And yet what's so peculiar is that he begins this psalm once more by saying, truly God is good to Israel. I find a lot in common with this sentiment it seems often so much easier to trust the Lord for others than it is to trust the Lord for ourselves. I find it much, much easier to have a corporate faith, to believe in the Lord's promises and His goodness to His people corporately, to His church as it is assembled, His church in a plural sense, but to trust the Lord for me, to trust in His kindness and His promises as they're given to individuals, often is a difficult task. This is what the psalmist is wrestling with. Surely the Lord will be good to Israel, but he begins to doubt whether or not God will be good to him. His doubt stems from his consistent experience of seeing the wicked prosper. In this particular psalm, the psalmist has reached a point where his doubt has fully developed into bitterness and envy of the wicked. However, the climax of this psalm, the turning point for the psalmist in his perception is the sanctuary. When he enters the sanctuary, his mind begins to change. And so I've taken our psalm and I've broken it up into a few sections. First, we'll focus on verses 6 through 12, where we see this envy of the wicked, or at least a bitterness towards the wicked. And the psalmist's frustration with what appears to be God's injustice, that God provides for the wicked, He promotes the wicked, and yet has neglected His people, the righteous and particularly the psalmist himself. And then we'll move on to verses 16 and 17, the climax of the text where the psalmist enters the sanctuary and is transformed. Then we'll focus our attention on two particular attributes of God that the psalmist encounters in his sanctuary experience. The eternality of God and the holiness of God. And then we'll conclude with the famous verse, verses 25 and 26, Whom have I in heaven but you? In your notes, I've written this under envying the wicked, verses 6 through 12. Psalm 73, verses 6 through 12 says, Therefore pride is their necklace. Speaking of the wicked, the garment of violence covers them. They're garbed with violence. They they decorate themselves with pride. They have set their mouth against the heavens. They're not only against the righteous, the people of God, but they've set their mouths against God Himself. And their tongue parades through the earth. They say, how does God know? And they're blaspheming God. They're questioning God. They're saying God does not exist. And if He does, He's not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. How does God know? And is their knowledge with the Most High? They're, they're putting the Lord God to the test. They're taking the Lord's name in vain. Essentially what the wicked are doing is they're, they're doing what the psalmist is doing, in a sense. They're looking at this life, here and now. They're looking at their own prosperity, their own affluence, and they're saying that if there were a God in heaven who knew all things, this wouldn't be the case. But because I, the wicked, am prospering, and the righteous remain oppressed without salvation, without deliverance, 
We can be sure that there is no God in heaven, and if there is, he's a blind God, a deaf God, an ignorant God, a God who does not see, a God who does not know. He does not see our wickedness. He does not know of our wickedness. And this is precisely why he does not exact justice on earth. This is the claim of the wicked. How does God know? Is there any knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Now the wicked, for the psalmist, are the people around him who are arrogant. It's one of the things that we see in the text. Violent is another. And mockers of God. And yet, in the perception of the psalmist, they seem to be always at ease. It's important that we remember that everyone who rebels in this life against God will not necessarily be miserable in this life. Just as everyone who obeys God in this life will not necessarily receive health and wealth in this life. There is no guarantee that Christians will be healthy and wealthy in this life. And there is no guarantee that the wicked will be sick and poor in this life. The psalmist wants justice right here, right now. And since this doesn't appear to be happening, he feels as though all of his purity, all of his obedience has been in vain. The psalmist is desperate, in desperate need of a proper view of eternity. That's the problem. What the psalmist sees as injustice with God only appears to be injustice because the psalmist is not looking down the line. He's not looking with an eternal viewpoint. He's forgetting about the life to come. Now, now I want to say something here because I think there are two pitfalls that it's easy for us to commit, to fall into. One is the prosperity gospel. It is easy for the Christian to think that if I obey God, that if I have enough faith, that God is obligated to bless me in this life, that I'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And the flip side of that is to believe likewise that the wicked, those who are not faithful to the Lord, those who are not obedient to His commandments, that they would be decimated, that they would be impoverished, that they would have none of the Lord's blessing here and now in this life. That is the prosperity gospel. That is a heresy. That is a lie. And yet, many of you have heard that. Many of you have heard John Piper crying out against the prosperity gospel. You've watched American Gospel, the film. right? You're very aware of the dangers of the prosperity gospel. One of my concerns pastorally is that although the church at large has done great work and made great strides against the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel, I think that we have, in our adjustment, our recalibrating, that we have perhaps overcompensated. And, and fallen in, in the ditch on the other side of the road. That we act as though God is completely arbitrary in how He acts and behaves, as it were, here in this life, on the earth. Now, the Bible does have promises for the righteous. And these promises are not only, they can never be less than, but they certainly are more. They include more than merely the life to come. That there is a blessing for the righteous here and now. And there is judgment for the wicked, not only in the life to come, but here and now. I'll give you an example. And some of you may be offended by this initially, but I I request that you would hear me out because I think you'll find that it's true. All poverty is rooted in sin. If you're poor, It is caused by sin. Here's the disclaimer. It may not be your sin. 
but it is always correlated directly to sin. The great theologian Ron Swanson once said that capitalism is God's way of determining who is smart and who is poor. (laughs) I do believe that capitalism is God's method of economics. I am a capitalist, without apology and without shame. The problem, however, though, is that there are many people who are poor in North Korea, but it's not because they're not hardworking. Their poverty is still directly correlated to sin, but it's the sin of someone else. It's the sin of of unrighteous rulers, oppressing, stealing, robbing. But the point is that all poverty can be tracked back in some sense to sin. And this is why. See, to to think that it may be any alternative to that is to ultimately, whether we recognize it or not, is to subconsciously indict God himself. Because you really, it's not, you really only have two options. You can indict man or you can indict God. So on the one hand, you can say poverty is always rooted in the sin of man. Or on the other hand, you can say, well, there are plenty of people who are righteous. There are plenty of people who are hardworking. They honor the Lord and they're not really being oppressed by anyone else. So it's not their sin and it's not the sin of someone else, but they just still happen to be poor. Well, see, so without recognizing what, what, that, what that communicates, what it conveys is this, is that God has somehow failed in his provision. And a lot of us have bought into this, right? The idea of, of overpopulation. Well, the idea of overpopulation is this. It's, it's the idea that God created a planet and a solar system, a universe, the cosmos. God created And then he commanded his image bearers to be fruitful and multiply. And he did this maniacally. He did this all while knowing that his image bearing creatures, obedience to his command to be fruitful and multiply would be the cause of their own destruction. The God, the creator of heavens and earth, he he was sitting back. Be fruitful, multiply, knowing that if we obeyed, there would be food shortages, energy crisis, global warming, rising tides, plague, pestilence, disease. I don't believe that. That view indicts God. And the scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every liberal a liar. Let God be true and every scientist a liar. Let God be true and CNN a liar. God's word. You want to be on the right side of history? Believe this book. Don't be embarrassed of the scripture. Don't be embarrassed of God's word. Because what you'll find time and time again is as the years go by, man only ever discovers what confirms the truth of God's word. God has created the world in such a way that if his image-bearing creatures obey his commandment to be fruitful and multiply, that they will be sustained. And not only sustained, not only survive, but thrive. See, the question is, what do you think of God? And, And then after we get our theology straight... From there, we began to do the work of anthropology. What is your view of man? Right? Do you see people created in the image of God as, as first and foremost parasites? That's how many people in our world view humanity. Parasites. Mouths to feed. But the Bible tells us that we're made in the image of God. It's precisely the opposite of the world's view. See, See, we, we're holding in tension these two doctrines, the Imago Dei and total depravity. So on the surface, we believe, the Christian faith believes, that on the surface, man is made in the image of God. And because of that, and because of God's common grace, man is capable of incredible things. Curing cancer, going to Mars, all these different things, finding new sources of energy and fuel, that man is 
capable of building suspension bridges and skyscrapers and all kinds of incredible things. So on the outward, on the surface, man is made in the image of God. And in common grace, man is capable of incredible feats. But beneath the surface, in the inmost heart, man is totally depraved. The man is opposed to God, at enmity toward God. And see, what our world says is precisely the opposite. Have you noticed this? So our world says, deep down, man is good. That's what Marx says. Rousseau, the great philosopher Disney, being one of the modern examples. Deep down, you have a heart pure as the driven snow. Deep down, you're wonderful, unique, beautiful, filled with nothing but good intentions. That all of your failures are not actually your failures. It's the product of society, systems of injustice, the culture at large influencing you in negative and harmful, destructive ways. So the world's view is this. Deep down on the inside, man is inherently good. But on the surface, man is a parasite. It'd be nice to have a smaller population. Abortion is a benefit to humanity at large. Less mouths to feed. Less people to care for. Less provision to be made. That's the world's view. On the inside, man is good. On the outside, man is a parasite. The Bible's view, precisely the opposite. On the inside, total depravity. On the outside, the Imago Dei, common grace. So what is your view of God? Is he a good provider? Does obedience to his commandments lead towards destruction or blessing? Did God command us to be fruitful and multiply? And if so, does God ever command his people to do that which would bring them ultimate harm? So what's your view of God? Is he a good provider and is he faithful? Is he credible? Is he someone that we can trust? That, that if we obey his commandments, it brings blessing rather than destruction. And then moving from theology, our view of God, to our view of man, is man good deep down, but a parasite, a liability on the outside? Or is man totally depra depraved deep down, in need of regeneration, in need of a spiritual rebirth, but on the outside, created in the image of God, and that, that image is, is tarnished by sin, but, but a vestige of the image of God still remains intact, and therefore, according to common grace doctrine, man is capable of doing incredible things. That should be our view. That should be our view. And I say all that to say this. Because of common grace, and because of the Imago Dei, because of a proper view of God, his provision, and who man is, even in light of sin, we as Christians should believe that ordinarily, ordinarily, obedience brings blessing. I'll say it again. Ordinarily, obedience brings blessing. One of my deep pastoral concerns is that in the church's attempts to oppose the prosperity gospel, they have effectively said that obedience means nothing. It might bring blessing, it might not. The promises of God are arbitrary. That blessing is arbitrary. God just kind of, he, he throws out blessing like candy and it has no basis whatsoever on man's obedience you have as good a chance of receiving the blessing of God in this life by being a rebel against the law of God than by being in submission to the law of God. That is not biblical. So yes, let us object to the prosperity gospel, but not to the point where we overcompensate to where we effectively are communicating to the church and to Christians and to the world that obedience only has significance for the life to come. That is not biblical. 
Why? Because we serve a God who meticulously and intimately cares about this world, His creation, this life. Sadly, many Christians are more spiritual than God who is spirit. Our God who is spirit and who is worshipped in spirit and in truth is a God who loves His physical creation. He so loved the world. Not only the elect people of this world, but He loves the cosmos. The very creation itself is groaning with great expectations for the sons of God to be revealed. The creation is longing to be restored, and God longs to restore His creation. He loves this world. He loves the physical cosmos that He created. And He loves His people. And He doesn't only love them in an eternal sense, but He loves them here and now. And he loves to bless his people here and now and provide for his people in this life. Obedience does bring blessing. The reason why our nation has prospered more than any other nation on the planet and done more good, more acts of humanitarianism, uh, given more, more generous, more benevolent towards other nations at a global level. The reason why America has done more of this than any other nation, I believe, is because America, other than Israel in the Old Testament, America has been the closest, not perfect, but the closest to actually living out the law of God. And God's law works. It works. When we obey the law of God, it works. I mean, what do you do, right? What what is the person who, if if we're not careful, we're so against the prosperity gospel, but what what do you do with, with what Paul says about children? He doesn't make any caveat. He doesn't give any disclaimer, no qualification. He just says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And it's the first commandment with a promise that it shall go well with you and that you would live a long life on the earth. And then he just moves on to this next point. He doesn't give any disclaimer. He doesn't say, but, you know, even children that obey their parents with Christian parents who raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, still there are exceptions in this life where he doesn't say any of that. He doesn't. Are there caveats? Yeah, but the Apostle Paul was perfectly comfortable writing to the Ephesian church and saying, if children obey their parents, they will be blessed, period. Right? He doesn't just quote the commandment from Exodus. He doesn't just quote the, the commandment from the Old Testament. Paul reaffirms the commandment and the promise in the New Testament for New Testament Christians. Because that's part of the problem. Evangelicals today, they would say, well, yeah, obedience brings blessing. And, but that was true for Israel. That was true underneath the Old Covenant. But Paul has no problem reaching back to the Old Covenant The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, not only the commandments themselves, but also the promises, and and then placing them right in the New Testament for New Covenant Christians and saying they're just as good. The promises are just as true and just as good today as they were then. Obedience brings blessing. It does. At a national level, at a family level, And at the individual level, obedience brings blessing. And that's why the psalmist is having such trouble with what he sees around him. See, you and I, we read Psalm 71, we read these first 12 verses, and and we're not very sympathetic towards the author. He says, I see the wicked growing in prosperity, and the righteous seem to be oppressed. And you and I have very little sympathy because we watched American gospel. We say, Psalm, just get it together, man. Stop, stop believing the prosperity gospel. What's wrong with you? Of course the wicked. Like, we're not even surprised. In fact, we've gone so far that we, we hold now to, to what I would call a poverty gospel. We actually think, in the way that the Pharisees thought that wealth 
and prosperity was a badge of God's approval. We actually think that the poorer we are and the sicker we are, the more we have God's approval over our lives. Like, like God doesn't love me unless I get cancer. To the point where we're virtually asking the Lord to give us suffering. Where there is no basis for that in the scripture. We rejoice and thank God when suffering comes. There's a basis for that in the scripture because of what suffering produces. But there is no precedence in scripture to request it. Only a fool does that. So we need a whole biblical theology. We need a a well-rounded orthodoxy that can indict the prosperity gospel And in the very same breath, with a straight face, with with no qualms, with no disclaimers, say, obedience brings blessing. Let me give you one more example. If I obey God's law, thou shalt not commit adultery. And I keep my wedding vows to my bride all the days of my life. And I obey God's word. Fathers, do not exasperate your children but raise them up, train them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. If I do this, by God's grace, it will only be because of God's grace, the grace he supplies, empowering me, enabling me to do this. But if by God's grace I accomplish this, fidelity in marriage and and good parenting as a father to my children, then my children will be better off than most. My children will have what our culture might call today privilege. It's not white privilege. It's not rich privilege. It's obedience privilege. And the Bible's term is not privilege, but blessing. We should make no apology. Yeah, we believe in privilege. God calls it blessing. And it's not a privilege that comes by the color of your skin. For God shows no favoritism. But it is a privilege, a blessing that comes by faithfulness. If you are faithful, faithful to the Lord, faithful to your spouse, faithful to your children, faithful to the local church, if you are hardworking, if you're strategic, if you have integrity in all these ways, again, ordinarily, Things will go well with you. And not only you, but your children and your children's children. That's the reality. Those are the facts. Look at the statistics. Look at the statistics. Fathers who abandon their children, the likelihood of those children winding up in prison, significantly higher than children who come from a two-parent home. The facts bear out this theological principle that obedience brings blessing. And that's why the psalmist is having such a hard time because he's not seeing that in his experience. He's saying, I know obedience brings blessing. You don't know 21st century church, right? Because in your attempts to indict the prosperity gospel, you've given into a poverty gospel. So you actually need your pastor to spend the first 30 minutes of his sermon reminding him about one of the most basic biblical truths that obedience brings blessing and and substantiating that statement as though it was obscure or crazy, right? I mean, that's why I've taken so long to labor the point because we've been so inundated with, well, suffering, 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 that I feel like I have to take 30 minutes to labor the point to to back up, to, to qualify the statement that obedience brings blessing. Of Christians of yesteryear, Christians of centuries past, they're like, if, if they were sitting here today, they'd be like, why is he still talking about that? Of course obedience brings blessing. The Apostle Paul would say, of course it brings blessing. The Puritans, of course it brings blessing. The Reformers, of course it brings blessing. The first century church, of course it brings blessing. Of course obedience brings blessing. Of course obedience to God doesn't just matter for the life to come, but it matters here and now. But we have to explain these things because we've overcompensated. We've recalibrated too far. But the psalmist, that's why he's struggling. 
And so I went to great lengths so that we would understand, so that we could be in the psalmist's shoes, as it were. That we could sense his frustration and sympathize with what he's seen before his eyes. The psalmist is perplexed. He is radically confused. His very faith is, is on the verge of being shipwrecked because he believes in the God of Scripture who keeps steadfast covenant with his people and gives blessing to those who obey him. And yet that's not what he's seen. He is seeing the very opposite. In his generation, in his time, he has seen the wicked prosper. And in his own personal life, he is experiencing oppression and harm. But then he enters the sanctuary. Verse 16 and 17 says this, When I pondered to understand this, to understand how a God who is just and a God who is faithful, who has made promises to his people, who made promises to me, would allow me to suffer while the wicked prosper. As I was pondering this, it was wearisome. It was troublesome in my sight until I finally gained understanding. It all finally began to make sense when what? When I entered the sanctuary of God. When I entered the sanctuary of God, then I was able to understand to perceive the end of the wicked. The psalmist admits that he was not seeing clearly. He was believing a lie. He was not living in God's reality. The psalmist thinks that he is righteous because he has been spending all of his time focusing on the wicked. See, it's easy to think that we're righteous when we compare ourselves to the wicked. However, it's extremely humbling when we rightly compare ourselves to God. So the psalmist sees two things when he enters the sanctuary. He sees that God is eternal and he sees that God is holy. Let me pause here for a moment. The psalmist is feeling really good about himself. See, see one of the, the things where, where he's just off, his perception is flawed, he's wrong. One of the ways that he's wrong is this. It's not that he is wrongly perceiving the wicked as wicked. It's that he's wrongly perceiving himself as righteous. So he looks at the wicked that surround him and he says, they're heinous, they're evil, they oppress the righteous, they lie, they're arrogant, they're swift to violence. And he's not corrected by any of these thoughts. And none of these thoughts are the problem. In all of, 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 of this side of his perception, the assumption is that the psalmist is correct. That he's right. The wicked really are that wicked. But where he's off is that implicitly he's assuming that he is really, really righteous. But you know why he feels really, really righteous? Because he's spending a lot of time listening to the Daily Wire and not a lot of time listening to Scripture. This was convicting for me this week. I want to confess that to you. Even as a pastor, I was convicted. I, I, I am so invested and intrigued by politics, culture, all these things, and I, I make no apology for that. I have no intentions of, of stopping that because, because I believe in a Christian faith, a Christian worldview that affects all of human society that God has something to say about everything, all of Christ for all of life, the civil sphere, economics, marketplaces, entertainment, everything, the whole nine yards. And so I want to be aware of what's going on in this world, and I want to be applying both law and gospel to every arena of human life. However, however, if I spend hours invested in that end, that, that purpose, as glorious and as biblical as it might be, 
but I spend minutes, hours over here, but minutes in prayer, minutes in the Word of God, minutes reading not just politicians, but theologians. So I've, I've had to rein myself in. I've had to force myself, all right, I'm going to listen to Ben Shapiro, and then I'm going to listen to Thomas Watson. I'm going to spend lots of time immersing myself in, in spiritual, eternal matters, reminding myself of the character and nature of God. Do you know why? For a host of reasons, but at least one would be this. Because when I look to the wicked, when I look to the world, I feel really good about Joel. But when I look to God, His gospel, and His law, I am brought exceedingly low. I'm reminded, as Job says, I am a worm. I'm reminded, as Peter says, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. I'm rem reminded of, of what Isaiah says when he falls prostrate before the Lord, holy. I I'm a man of unclean lips and an impure heart. And Isaiah, the, the reality is Isaiah was the best of his contemporaries. He was the best of his peers. But when confronted with the Lord, when he went into the sanctuary, Isaiah is caught up. When he went into the heavenly sanctuary and he's confronted with an image, with a view of the thrice holy God, all he can say is that you are holy. And I am sinful. As Christians who believe that the Bible is a big book, not a 30-page pamphlet, but a big book, and it applies to all of life, that the Christian worldview, that the Word of God has something to say about politics and economics, it has something to say about vocation. It has something to say about entertainment, the arts, and everything else. As Christians, conservative Christians, who believe that and are working towards that end, all of that is wonderful. Yes and amen. But let us also be diligent to often enter the sanctuary and to be reminded that yes, the wicked out there need to be opposed. Yes, the wicked out there, they need to be decried. We need to speak truth. We need to prophesy. We need to pray. We need to engage. But if it were not for Christ, if it were not for Christ, His love, His mercy, His grace, Christ and Him crucified, there go I, but for the grace of God. Then in a very real sense, I am the wicked. And the only reason I can truthfully categorize myself as the righteous is because of the righteousness of Christ. It's not because of me. None of this is inherent to me. Right? It's, not, it's not that I, I hold to these conservative principles and values and I vote the way that I do and I see things the way that I do. Right? Because it's easy to look at, at the wicked and not only say they're malicious, but say they're stupid. They're just dumb. It's so obvious. It's so painfully obvious that this doesn't work. How many times do we have to try communism? How many hundreds of millions of people have to die before we realize this isn't a good idea? Socialism works, it's just never been tried correctly. How dumb, how stupid, right? And so we, we look, we look to the wicked, and we're not just, we're not just aware of, 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 of the immorality, but we're aware of, of the, the stupidity, the foolishness of the worldview and all the ways that it doesn't work. And it's so easy to become arrogant. As though we came up, we came up, with a conservative worldview that we hold. No, we didn't. But I think that subconsciously, I would never say that because the words even coming out of my mouth are so blatantly arrogant and prideful. But subconsciously, I, I, I start to believe that. I start to believe that the difference between myself and the wicked is my morality and my intellect. 
They're, they're immoral and dumb. I'm moral and smart. How arrogant. It's not just arrogant, it's false. It's not true. I only believe what I believe. I only say what I say. I only hold to what I hold to because of Christ. And because He's revealed it to me by His grace. And because He's given me a new heart. He's changed my disposition. There go I, but for the grace of God. I need to engage in this world, in this culture, in this political system with all that's going on. But I need to enter the sanctuary. I need to be reminded of the end of the wicked, but not only the end of the wicked. See, what what the psalmist is also confronted by is this. He's not just reminded that they're in, that that God sets them on slippery slopes, that that they're just, that they're right on the edge, they're right on the cliff, They're, they're just a moment away from destruction, right? When he enters the sanctuary, he's reminded of the end of the wicked to where he goes from, from a, a, a position of envying the wicked to a position of, of, of if anything, having pity. Right? I, I, here's, here's a good question that you can ask yourself. How, it's not just what, what you think of the wicked or what you think of their policies and what you think of this. That's all fine. But how angry are you at, how, how <laughs> let's just use this as just a real tangible example. How angry are you at Joe Biden? How angry are you at Kamala Harrison? Because I think if we, if we entered the sanctuary, if we spent more time in prayer, more time with the Lord, you know what we would feel? We'd feel anger towards their positions, anger towards that demonic, and it is demonic, a demonic worldview. Marxism was forged not by Karl Marx in the ultimate sense. It was forged by Satan in the pit of hell. Hell. And so we still feel a righteous indignation against these things, but when we think of the people who are promulgating it, we we would feel a a legitimate, sincere sense of pity. We just pity them. They're so foolish. They're so deceived. They're so blinded. It's sad. It's sad. And so one of the things that the psalmist experiences when he's confronted with the Lord, when he goes to not just meet with the culture, but he goes to meet with God, One of the things that he sees as he sees the holiness of God, he sees the end of the wicked. And that their end, and and, and the ultimate sense, and the big scheme of things, their end is right around the corner. It's swift. And they're like phantoms, like vapors. Yeah, yeah, they're prospering, but, but, but it's so temporary. It's so momentary. How could I envy these people? I, I, in my flesh, I thought they have it so good. They have it so good, it's so unfair, it's so unjust. They don't have it good. All the prosperity that the Lord and the sovereignty is allowing is just further deceiving them, leading towards their ultimate destruction. It would be like envying the wicked is like envying a fish that gets the bait. Man, he got a full meal. Look at that. Look at the size of that bait. And like, oh, and it was really good. And that's, that's exactly what fish love. They, you know, it tastes good. Like, you're forgetting the hook. Yeah, they, they, yeah, the fish got a meal on his way to becoming a meal. On his way to being hooked, scaled, fried, and eaten. Don't envy the fish. That's the wicked. Right? They're, they're, they're fat. They're prospering. They're in places of prestige and power. And all of it is like a bait that the Lord in his providence and sovereignty has allowed them to eat for a moment so that his hook of eternal judgment might catch him by the gills, and that he might further justify himself in his eternal destruction of the wicked in the life to come. There is nothing to envy. There is nothing to be jealous of. So the psalmist, when he goes into the sanctuary, he sees the holiness of the Lord, and he all of a sudden goes from envy to pity towards the wicked. But he doesn't just see the wicked properly in light of the holiness of God, he also sees himself properly. Notice what he says. Verses 21 through 24, when my heart was embittered, he was bitter, he was envious, and I was pierced within, I was senseless. He doesn't just say I was immoral. 
I, I, was, I was wicked myself. No, he says, I was senseless and ignorant. Turns out I was the dumb one. Here I am looking at the wicked, pointing at the wicked, accusing the wicked of not only immorality but stupidity, and yet, in a brutal sense of irony, I realized that I was senseless. I was ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Like an animal. Dumb. Stubborn. Barbaric. Carnal. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. Don't miss that, church. When he comes into the sanctuary, he not only sees, first he sees God. That God is eternal and God is holy. In light of seeing God properly, getting his theology realigned, he now has better anthropology. He can now see the wicked properly, but with this recalibrated anthropology in light of a recalibrated theology, he doesn't just see others, he sees himself. He recognizes that he was a beast. He was senseless. He was a brute. He was ignorant. He was dumb. He was a barbarian. And at the very same time, he sees that in this state of being a beast, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. Look at the nearness, the closeness, the intimacy, the affection, the love. You've taken hold of my right hand. When? When, when I was on my best behavior? No, when, when I was my most foolish I just got done spending all week long complaining, subconsciously accusing you of injustice, not being fair, and, and looking at the wicked and boasting to myself by comparison. I spent all week long talking about how proud they are without realizing how proud I am neglecting you, neglecting your holiness, neglecting your character, neglecting your nature, not spending time with you, but spending time looking at the wicked, focusing on the wicked, not pitying them, but envying them, wishing that I could be like them, claiming that you're unjust, and claiming that I'm the one who's really innocent, I'm the one who's really righteous, I was brutish, I was foolish, I was blind, I was deaf, I was like a donkey, I was like a, an ox, I was like a beast before you, and in that state, in that disposition, on my worst behavior, in my most foolish state, not only did you tolerate me, not only did you consent to be in my presence, but you were near to me. You, you, you came close to me. You pursued me, and you held my right hand. In my ignorance, in my pride, you were pleased to hold me, to keep me, to be with me. With your counsel, you will guide me. And afterward, even in my foolishness, you'll receive me to glory. Sin makes us stupid. And it doesn't just make us stupid, which is a good biblical word in the Proverbs, stupid. Children, you don't need to use stupid in an improper way, but God does use the word. There are right ways to do it. Sin doesn't just make us stupid, but in being a beast, it speaks of the psalmist's ignorance. It also speaks of his hideous appearance. Sin, sin makes us ugly. Sin is shameful. It's embarrassing. When all of a sudden we, 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 we get a glimpse, we, we get, you know, we look in the mirror, right? It's like, it's like going all day long, and not, not just a normal day around the house, you know, or whatever, or working, you know, virtually from home, but let's say it was like one of the biggest days of your life, and you were meeting with several influential people, and then you go home, and you find out that, that you had like Sharpie marker on your face because your kids were drawing in the morning during breakfast and they wrote on you and you didn't realize it. And you're just horrified, you're embarrassed. That's what it's like for the psalmist. He goes into the sanctuary and he's like, I've been making all these judgments about the wicked and I've had like, like an entire stem of broccoli stuck between my teeth. I, I've, I've looked like an idiot. I'm embarrassed. 
Sin makes us stupid. It makes us dull, but it also makes us ugly. And in our ugliness and in our ignorance, in in our beast-like state, God not only forgives us, He draws near. You were close to me, and you held my right hand. You guided me, and when it's all said and done in this life, you've promised to receive me to glory. Each of us need to be spending regular time in the sanctuary to ensure that our perspective is accurate in light of the holiness of God and in light of eternity. When we look at the wicked, when we listen to the news, political podcasts, articles, etc., which I think are all good practices within reason, we are tempted by pride. But when we look at the Lord, we are humbled by grace. And it's after this revelation, this transformation, the psalmist goes from envy and bitter, bitterness towards the wicked to pitying the wicked and being in a posture of humility and appreciation, and great adoration and thankfulness to the Lord and His mercy and His kindness, His willingness to be near to the psalmist despite His brutish, beast-like behavior. And after all of this, the conclusion is whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The psalmist is reminded the end of it all that even if the wicked do prosper in this life, And even if God in His sovereignty chooses to treat the righteous as Job, that at the end of the day, the true gift, the true reward, the truest blessing is God. The Lord is near to us. He's near to the righteous. He's far from the wicked. The Scripture is clear that the Lord is far from the, the wicked. His face is opposed to them, turned away from them. But he is near to the righteous, to those who fear him. And at the end of the day, he's our treasure. He's our reward. He's our portion. He's our joy. He's the joy in all other joys. The Lord is our great reward. And the psalmist is finally reminded of that fact. That whatever may happen, whatever occurs... I have Christ. What do I get for all my obedience? Ordinarily, blessing in this life. But even in those worst case scenarios, what do you get for following Jesus? You get Jesus. That's what you get. He's the treasure in a field that's hidden that a man is willing to go and sell everything he has to purchase that field. He's the pearl of great price. He is the eternal reward. He's the joy in our joys. You get Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you that he is our portion. He is our great joy. He is our exceedingly priceless reward. Father, I pray that as we look at our crazy world that continues to top each day its foolishness, when we think that they can do nothing dumber than they did the day before, they say, oh yeah, watch this. Here's a new policy. Here's a new idea. And it's so easy to get angry, to get arrogant, to get prideful. So Lord, help us. For every time we look to the culture, help us even more so to look to you. To be reminded of your holiness. To be reminded of the end of the wicked, that it's nothing to envy. And to be reminded of our, ourselves in our own sin, in our incredible need for Christ and His grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.